What is going on, Adobe Live? Ladies and gentlemen, I am super excited to be here. And we have a very special guest, Julie Sandusky. How are you doing, Julie? I'm doing well. How's everybody? I think I think they're going to be feeling, even if they don't feel it, they're going to be feeling it later today. But before later we can today. all feel it, yes. Well, in a few minutes, that's what I mean. Before, <laughs> <laughs> you were like, Brandon, what time of day is it? It has to be now or it's not, it's not, uh, that's not what you mean. All right, guys, before we get into the excitement and what Julia, or excuse me, Julie has today, I had to have so many good friends, Julie and Julia, I mix it up, but totally we have good. a special Julie here today. And before we get into the excitement, and I'm not going to steal any of Julie's thunder about what we're doing today, I, we just have some house cleaning items to go over before we begin. Now, let's head on to the schedule. All right, today we have... We've done a lot today. We're, we're a little later in the day. Right now we are at Julie Sandusky. We're doing the mobile app design, a particular mobile app design related to restaurants I've eaten so I don't get the get hangry during this episode. <laughs> but next <laughs> we have at 2 p.m. PT, we have XD Daily Creative Challenge with Howard Pinsky. And to follow up at 2.30 p.m. PT, we have Design in the Dark with Andrew Hock. All right, guys. So. Now that we have kind of gone into that, I'm really excited, Julie. First off, I want to say, if you guys are not familiar with Julie, definitely check out her information down in the description. Don't leave yet, but she has a background with IDEO and Microsoft, and she's also been an Adobe Creative resident. That's all I'm going to say. No more, no more thunder stolen. I'm going to hand <laughs> it off to you, Julie. What are we doing today, and who are you? Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Julie. If you don't know me, um, I was a creative resident last year, so you might've seen me on live before um, or some on some of Adobe's channels. Brandon, super excited to get to know you too. I've seen you on Instagram. Um, so yeah, I'm so glad you're here with me today. Um, so today we're gonna be designing a pop-up restaurant app and I'm gonna go into what that even means. Um, but first I'll give a quick intro about myself. So. My name is Julie Sandusky. I'm based in Seattle, Washington, originally from New York. Um, I'm a UX and product designer, um, focus on circular design and food. So what that means is basically, I think sustainability, um, no waste, that kind of stuff. Um, I have a little motto here that is good design is better when it does good for people and planet. Um, so yeah, a little bit about my residency, I'll show you a few projects, but I focused on designing solutions to reduce food waste. So I've been super passionate about food my whole life. Um, and I've tried to weave that into my design work all the time. Um, I also love like public speaking. So I've gotten to speak at a bunch of fun events and conferences. And so hopefully maybe you've seen me there as well. A bit about my work. So it's all food themed pretty much all the time. Um, so these are a couple of projects that I did during my residency. The first big one was called Good Neighbor and it was a community driven ingredient sharing platform. So think like I have food going bad soon at the back of my fridge and I don't want to throw it out. So let me share it with my friends or my neighbors. Um, so that was an app experience that you can see on Behance, on my Behance. The next one, I worked with a nonprofit in Seattle that harvests all the fruit trees in the city. We have like hundreds of thousands of pounds of fruit growing, like kiwis and apricots, like all the things you could ever dream of. Um, a lot so of this was a things. yeah, a lot of tasty <laughs> things, but also a lot of a lot of fruit on the sidewalk. You'll just see like blackberries smashed and plums smashed. So there's a lot of food to eat. Um, so this was a harvesting map of urban fruit trees in Seattle. And then my last one, which I'm working on right now actually, is called Farewell. Um, so I am basically tackling the problem of how do we increase cur uh, curbside compost pickup in cities like New York. Um, so I'm redesigning the compost bin and just got a little bit of funding to do that. So I'm super excited to be getting more into like industrial design too. So wow. going from digital to industrial a little bit. And that's a bit about me. I know Brandon, you mentioned my background. Um, I'm self-taught from, you know, back in my college days, I, I learned design from like side projects and stuff like that. And then I got to work at IDEO for six months on the future of food and then worked at Microsoft after and then Adobe. So that's like my realm of experience so far. That is insane. I can't wait to, guys, <laughs> put your, 
put your behinds in the seat, like strap down, because we're not only gonna get into designing here, hopefully if we can multitask enough, maybe we can get some bits, secrets and tidbits about the creative journey that Julie has been on from, you know, being self-taught, working at IDEO, Microsoft, and really doing what she's doing now with getting funding for a lot of her, um, what seems to be economic projects. And I would hopefully, because I'm also curious and selfish in this regard, I would love to know how that process is as we get into what we're doing today. Does that sound cool, Julie? Totally, I'm excited. All right, awesome. I hope you guys in the chat are too. There's quite a few people. We'll get started in a moment, guys. Um, I see yeah. some, I see Kyle in the chat, Hamas, Sandip, all the peeps, Ariana, what's happening? ladies and gentlemen. All right, Julie, let us begin. Where are we starting with today and tomorrow's project? Yeah. So whenever I start a project, I usually like to lay out kind of the why. So why am I going to go after this project? Um, so yeah. we're about to get, we're going to get started on the designing part super soon. Um, but I'm going to lay out a little bit about like how I do like research and structure of my project um, before I get into the design mode. So the question we're tackling today is how might we enable home cooks or professional chefs to successfully start a pop-up food business? So during COVID, um, millions mm. were left without work and the restaurant industry especially was hit super hard, um, leaving many talented chefs um, without work and having to get creative to make up that income. So in Seattle, especially, I saw a huge rise in pop-ups, which are basically just like mini restaurants operating um, at like an individual scale. And so what we're designing today is basically an app that will help chefs or even home cooks do something like that. So right now people are like doing stuff through Instagram, taking orders through Instagram and managing it that way, yeah. um, which is kind of wild. So <laughs> the app is inspired Order in the that. comments. Yeah, order in the comments, <laughs> DM me, That's I'm awesome. sold out. It's, it's really cool. Um, I usually pull up some articles from, you know, whenever I start a project. So doing some like secondary research that way. Um, so these are some fun articles I've read about, um, you know, cook up cooking and pop ups. And recently I learned that California approved um, you to basically start a food business from your own kitchen at home, which sounds a little scary. But if wow. the permits are in place and you get approval, then you can become like a chef with a business from your own kitchen. Um, so that's super exciting. So this is also designed for people like that. It's very interesting with like all the things that are happening right now, the innovation that's happening just to overcome this large problem that we are really all in. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to see in the way that, well, what we're going to be doing here, but it's just fascinating to see how things change when people are yeah. faced against um, really anything. Yeah. Even like, you know, remotely working now and live streaming re remotely, like so many things have changed during this time. Yeah. Um, so the next thing I do is I check out like competitors. So who's doing this already? So there's a few ones that I took screenshots of their current experiences that they have. Um, I list out like the pros and what could be better. I don't like using cons because everything is there for improvement. <laughs> um, everything's a learning experience. Everything's, no bad things, ladies and it's gentlemen. It's all a rough draft. Everything's a rough draft. Um, yeah, so I list out a few different um, competitors that are there, what they're doing, what they're doing well, what could be improved. Um, and then that helps me define a little bit more about um, what I'm going to do. So talking about this pop-up restaurant food business, there's a three th main value points. One is that it's more accessible to people. So like starting a food truck business, for example, is $100,000, whereas this wow. you know ability to do it from your home is $500 permit. Um, it's an opportunity. A lot of sh like chefs and people aren't eligible for certain loans given by the government. And so being able to recoup those losses by making your own pop-up is an opportunity. And then the last thing that I think is really important is that oftentimes when we're ordering food or going to a restaurant, we don't get that direct connection with like a chef or someone making the food, right? There's right. like a, a brick wall between us. Um, and so Literally. that's a <laughs> Literally, yeah, 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 it's like the kitchen wall. I mean, some places have open kitchens, but we're not going into restaurants anyway. Um, so how do you like connect people together? Um, food starts from a story. And so being able to connect with a chef who's making that food wanted to be a big core part of this experience. A few pain points. So it's difficult to get started as a home cook. Manage orders via DMs on Instagram could be really difficult. 
Um, and then as a customer, you know, so many people want to support local um, chefs, local people. So how do you enable customers to do that with each other? And then I go through a few feature brainstorms and um, write out some ideas that I have, and then that will help inform the experience. In an ideal world, I also will, you know, actually talk to chefs and talk to people. Um, I've had the chance to talk to a couple um, pop-up chefs here in Seattle, which has been really fun. And so oh. that's a bit about like the base of my process. The base of the process in this the next two days journey. I'm excited about this. Yes. How long did you take in preparedness of doing this? Like, um, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Just out of no, curiosity for those who are in the chat. Yeah. So whenever I do a project, I'm always thinking about like, what if this became like a real thing? And so I want to make sure I have a good foundation. So right. um, it does take me a little while to come up with all this stuff. Um, but I think it's really, really helpful to have because that's, you know, if you're if you're designing apps like this, you want them to be super use, usable, um, relevant to the actual who you're designing for. Um, for sure. So yeah, I, I usually do a big a big haul of a structure in the beginning. Um. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna and start. Before with we like, start, before we yeah. before we start, I want everybody in the chat just really quick before we get started. If you guys have questions while Julie is going through the awesomeness that she is, is putting things together, this chat is not only for me and her. Obviously, you guys are here watching. So if you guys have any questions related to what she's doing, her process, or anything in general, if a question comes to mind, put them down in the chat. And if you guys came here a little bit late and you guys are on YouTube, come on, jump over to Behance. I'll have small messages like this throughout our production here. But all right, Julie, just wanted to put that out there. If you guys have yeah. questions, just pop them up so I can bring them up and pose them to you as we go. Yeah. If anyone has any questions about like UX research, design research, stuff like that, um, even career things, you know, like starting self-taught and then getting a job, all that kind of stuff is super interesting to me. So yeah, let me know. Um, so overall, we're designing a food pop-up app. So we're going to focus today on the chefs themselves. So Let's say I'm a cook and I want to start my own little food business. Um, we're gonna start with that first onboarding flow. So what I typically do is I um, will start out with some sketches. So obviously we're in XD, so my sketches are elsewhere. So I brought up just um, some quick uh, boxes to it, it basically <laughs> indicate where text is gonna be and images and things like that. Um, yeah. So I want to play with 3D Transform today. Brandon, have you played a lot with that? I have tremendously. Fun, How are you doing? It's a it? fun one. It's great. I love like I'm excited for when we can have like full almost like dimension objects in there, you know? <laughs> yes. And then play around with that animation. <laughs> um but for now, 3D Transform is really awesome. If you haven't checked it out, anyone in the chat? So I'm gonna pull in some photos, which I have over here. To bring my and when you're screens. doing photos, let me just ask. Um, yeah. How exactly do you go about getting your photos? Like when you're preparing something, how exactly are, uh, I know a lot of people like to pull in things from Unsplash, Pexels. Like, what is the, how are you grabbing your assets? Yeah, so I actually, so Stock, Adobe Stock just had the, their free version come out. Yeah. Um, I think at Max it was. And so I actually went there because I think a lot of people look for those free images. Um, it's Definitely. hard to get the stock credits sometimes. It's inaccessible. So um, the free uh, folder of, of Adobe stock images were great. So a lot of those photos are from here. I've also used Unsplash. I know there's another one called like Pexels, I think. Uh, so I, yeah, I typically will just license some or download some from other websites. And then I usually just stack them in a folder like on my desktop, which I have here. All ready to rock. <laughs> All ready to rock. Um, and I love how it's just easy to like drag them in, you know, and then play with the mask. So, 
what I'm doing here is I kind of want the first screen to, uh, I mean, it's the first impression, right, of an app. And yeah. so being able to show the core value of the app, which is like chefs and their stories. So I want to have a bunch of photos of like chefs and the food they make and make you feel like really at home. Um, so I'm going to start home out with like hungry, mm. home and hungry. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start out with a bunch of just like photos of of chefs and some good food. And then I'm going to play What is your favorite play type of food, food by the way? I get that question a lot. Um, it's really <laughs> hard for got, me to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me to answer. I like things I like cooking a lot are yeah. cuisines with a lot of spices in them. So like Indian Whoa. food and um, Thai food. I just love playing around with all those different flavors. But I also like part. Of, I'm part Italian, so I love pasta. You know, mm. making pasta, things like that. Comfort food. Same here. I um, I'll let you work for a second. I'll fill in my favorite food. You, those of you guys in the chat will actually probably get this kind of. Uh, actually, let me leave this story, Julie. <laughs> I was like, I was, let me tell the pizza story that I made last night. It had. It was related to spices, and I was like, uh, I want to hear it. <laughs> I literally just put pizza dough, cheese, and then threw cayenne pepper on it. I was like, there we go. It's the Brandon special. There um, we go. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Was it good? It, it was good for my taste buds, but I was asking my partner, I was like, could we, could, could this potentially be a, a, a party thing? Like a, a appetizer? And he was like, definitely not. Hey, you could run a <laughs> pop up. <laughs> Brandon special, you know? Yeah. We had a pizza party, not really party, but like I had my housemates. We had a little pizza oven in the backyard. Right. And so we made homemade pizzas outside last week. It was great. Like on the grass or was this a grill sort of operation? It's like a mini portable pizza oven. It's really cool. It was called a rock box. Oh, dang. Yeah. Um, it cooks pizza in a minute. So super crazy, but really, really good. How's the chat going over there? Anything interesting? That is, let me see. Uh, actually, we were dealing with some uh, some mic things, some oh. audio technical difficulties on my end, but we're all good. We're all, we're, all things are good. Guys, what's going on, Voodoo Val? Always in the chat, amazing, love it. Guys, we had Patricia, see, Patricia. Hey. I was actually gonna mention, yeah, were you guys in the same? Um, yeah, we're really good friends. I was about and to say, cause what? We were, yeah, we were creative residents together. I was, I was about to say, I was like, I wonder if you guys were in the same, um, I was about to say same class. I, I really don't know what to, <laughs> to I'd say it. cohort, yeah. Cohort, there we go. You guys were in the same cohort because she does a lot of uh, sustainability and like future city uh, related stuff. And when I saw your, your slides, I was like, wow, I, I wonder if um, you guys were linking up or whatnot, or if you guys work together in some capacity. Yeah. Um, we do. We're actually running a workshop together in January with ING, which is going to be really fun. <laughs> but yeah, we always hop on each other's streams and things like that. So it's good to see you there, Patricia. Yeah. And so let me, so what do you have like a color palette? This is one thing because I struggle and probably a lot of people who are thinking of this, but too scared to ask in the chat, but yeah. I will take one for the team because I still have not mastered this. I can't even put the word mastered in the same sentence as this question. Color palettes. Yeah. Do you? How do you find your colors? Do you use a tool to find the colors um, that you utilize or what is the process for you there? Assets is one thing you're like, photo looks good, let's use it, but colors. Yeah, colors hard. Um, typically what I do is I think of like the words that I want the experience to feel like so like for this one i want it to be inviting and warm um but also like professional so yeah. i usually put those words sometimes i look at like the psychology of colors which i think is really interesting um so like a lot of food apps have like, use orange and red and i think blue i forget the other one um but there are certain words that are associated with this color. So I use that a lot. And then I often go to Pinterest and look at different color palette combinations. There we go. I feel like I that's the winner though. I feel like Pinterest yeah. should be first. I like to look at, and you can you can tell me if I'm wrong. 
I, I, I call this, this is the way that I cheat. I'm like, all right, I have no idea how to use these colors at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me no, find Pinterest somebody. is super helpful. Yeah. There are in, some people in, who like focus their whole life on just color, colors and color matching. So. Yeah, that's like a whole, that's, that's a whole skill set. When people are like, Brandon, how do you pick your colors? I'm like, to be honest with you, I try to find exactly what I'm trying to recreate. And I'm like, oh, how do they use these colors? Perfect. Let's just change one color. <laughs> My yeah, answer there you right go. there. There you go. So I'm playing with 3D Transform a little bit. I kind of want to have this like effect where there's photos moving behind the front photos. Um, yeah. So I'm imagining like when you download this app, um, you'll have this almost like immersive experience on the first page that walks through like a bunch of different chefs. So I'm just playing around with, with that. How much have you messed around with uh, 3D Transform? And have you used it on anything but or except credit cards? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I haven't played around with it a ton. Um, I'm trying to think of like, I've used it a lot for making like mock-ups. So once I'm done with a design and I want to, I don't know, put it in real space or on like a an iPhone that I have in XD, I will like use 3D Transform to move it and have it seem kind of 3D. That's like the main yeah. use case I've used it, but I've seen a lot of people do it, use it for credit cards and stuff like that, which is pretty good. Yeah, I've been seeing it a lot with this new trend called glass morphism. Have you heard of it? I have not, no. What? Even our man Howard Pinsky, glass? I think, did like a special. Oh glass no. Morphism. It's like basically what it is, not the not the name, but the okay. um, it's basically when people do transparent or like almost trans i don't know if it's transparent or translucent i got to see in biology so just bear with me <laughs> i don't i don't know I, they were like brandon what is the liquid translucent or transparent i was like you can't see uh, through it I don't, uh, so like, I don't um, there know. was just there was just tears on my uh test um oh. so yeah um one wait thing so wh what is it it's just like a transparent it's like a half transparent card that blurs the background it's on um okay. so things can move behind it and it kind it, just imagine there's glass like real glass but it's kind of um i don't know there's a technical term for it i guess but it's like blurred okay. glass and so whatever is behind it gets blurred and it's a really cool effect um Interesting. If you guys Yes, if you guys are interested in that, it's basically what is on the trending page on Dribble. So if you guys didn't know the name, now you do. Um, there you go. I wanted to, a quick story time as we're putting this together. And I know this is going to be difficult because we were talking about how challenging it is to move things. And okay. uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, while we're working in chat at the same time. But can you tell us a little bit about how you got into working with IDEO. IDEO was yeah. your internship, correct? Or correct. That, that was what you were doing while in college. Yeah. 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 Yep. How did that how did that work out? How did you get in? Yeah. So they run what's called a collab program, which is basically where they pull in a bunch of people, interdisciplinary um, folks. So you don't just have to be a designer. You can also be like a more business person and so on. Um, and they focus on a big topic. So the topic at the time was the future of food. And that was like a huge, huge passion of mine. And I yeah. also was kind of like a new designer at the time. I think I was a, I was a junior um, when I did it. So I just, app I applied and you basically, the way their application worked in the past was just like a couple paragraphs and then your portfolio. Um, so I had a bunch of projects that I worked on like on the side and then, um, had an interview and their interview was like a full day makeathon. So they brought you in and then gave That's you a project awesome. prompt. And then you had the whole day to work on that project. And at the end you presented it. And the way they kind of evaluated you was they had IDEO folks like sent around each group. Um, and they just like watch how you work, how you brainstorm and stuff like that. So that's how I got into it. Um, and I spent six months there. So I ended up canceling my study abroad, I was supposed to go to Chile, canceled it and then worked, worked <laughs> there for six months. It was so, it was so worth it. Um, one of the projects I got to work on, um, in the beginning was Good and Gather, which is, is the target food brand that you've probably seen around. Um, so being able to like see things come to real life was really, really exciting. 
and very worth it. I still went to Chile later on. <laughs> <laughs> you can always That's postpone okay. and do it later. Exactly. Now, uh, got you. So what are we, what are we, are we still working in on the assets? What, what are you thinking about now? Are you just moving the, trying to find? Yeah. Uh, right now. So, to us. so the happening? way that I'm doing this right now is I'm going to use auto animate and I want the photos to kind of like, you know, I think there's an animation principle that's like the things closest to you move faster. Um, right. Whereas the things farther away from you move slower. So I want to kind of create that effect um, of like photos moving as you open up this screen. So I'm just playing mm -hmm. around with auto animate. So I've copied the artboard, made a direct copy. And then if you can see when I click on this artboard, you can see all of the photos underneath. Mm -hmm. And then I just moved them up so that the other photos will appear. And then I started playing around with like where they are located and so on. So I, I, I just kind of mess around with it and see see what happens. So I'll like preview, you know? Um, yeah. So sometimes I want things to move like really, really far. That's one thing that um, I think most people don't know about Adobe XD and the animations when we're moving things. The further you are animate, or the further you, I, actually, I'm gonna let you explain this because you also might have mastered some of this yourself. Like the further you pull things away, the, the faster, uh, slower they go. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's I something I feel like I realized when I was just playing around with it. Um, that's how that you get those cool effects. But yeah, you can move things. Sometimes it's hard to grab specific things, but. You can move elements like super, super far up and the farther you move them, the faster they'll go in that animation. So when you when you are in prototype mode, you're setting a duration, right? So this duration on the right here. So if I yeah. make this like one second, the animation has only that amount of time to complete. And so if objects are super, super far up, they'll go really fast. And if ob objects are super close to your final animation, they'll go much, much slower. Yeah, that was, um, I was, go ahead, go ahead. What were you about to say? No, I'm just going to do a rough animation for now and we can always like mess around with it later. But this is where I'm at. I'm at. <laughs> That's pretty Jeez. good for how, how long, when did we start? We are 28 minutes in, ladies and gentlemen. And I think for the five, first five minutes, I was fangirling out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, uh, so sweet. Yeah, yeah so this is where we're at. We have a little fun movement going on there i'm going to add some text too on top of it yeah one thing um i was talking to this guy his name's igor vensko we actually did a collaboration um together and we, we made a not really tutorial but we were live streaming together and he was showing me how he scaled um, not only moved things just like you're doing now but he also like scaled the images um oh. in the masks and I was like, what, you can do that? I was like, ah, that's <laughs> and he a good was like, idea. Yeah, man, yeah, see, see, we're, we're out here teaching each other. Yeah, no, yeah, if you like click in and then scale the mass as you move it, that that's super cool. We'll have to play around with that. So I'm gonna add a title here. Let me know what you think, but I kind of feel like the first title should be something about like experiencing home or like sharing your story, something like that. So I'm gonna just Share start with that for now. Share the food. <laughs> Share the food. Give me the food. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just guys. That. That's what I came here. Julie was like, they tried to sell me on today's episode. And they were like, look, listen, Brandon. Today's <laughs> segment is on pop-up food restaurants, and it's a mobile app. And I was just like, <gasps> and fanned myself before I fainted. I quickly said yes and accepted. So Julie, <laughs> you're the reason, and this app idea is the reason why I'm here today. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I hope you I hope you ate lunch already. Where are you located, Brandon? I don't know if I know that. The sad thing is, well, first off, let me just start by saying I don't know my street address. I know my home address. I don't know the okay. street that I live on. Okay. Um, that just tells That's you how okay. much I stay inside. Um <laughs> <laughs> I mean you've got I'm a like, pretty I'm, cool setup. I can't I, I exactly I'm not surprised. <laughs> People are like, Brandon, you do really nice technical things, but like, where's your outside life? And I'm like, who needs that? We make ours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, exactly. Let me let me ask. Let me let me look for some things in the 
in the, we've been talking, I've been very curious and trying to have story time, especially also, I want to hop back to the IDEO thing in just a bit. Yeah. I have some questions that I think might be uh, of interest to those who are watching. Uh, but cool. let me pop in the chat really quick. All right, let us see. Voodoo is feeling things on a spiritual level. Sometimes when I'm a host, I'm like, yo, I'm trying to know, <laughs> trying to know you want to do art today. Well, actually, I don't understand. Um, oh, Voodoo is basically just saying sometimes she's doing live streams with other people and she's like, look, this entire hour, I just want to know about you and what you do. Voodoo, <laughs> I'm on the same wavelength. I have so many questions that I'm bottling up and I'm like, just let her, you know, let Julie, let's, let's, let's show. We can have, awesome we can have story time. Don't worry. Yes, I'm down. Exactly. I'm all about story time. I'm like <laughs> trying to do story time and like um, also fix my uh, my audio stuff in the background. Yeah. Um, yeah, you are truly a multitasker, I have to say. <laughs> Wait, what was that last sentence? You're a multitasker. I'm trying. Actually, that was the key You're word. You're doing really I was, well. I, I appreciate it. I'm like trying to keep my earbud in. Like I bought, I have so many stories. I bought earbuds because my last one died. Okay. And these ones, when I, I'm a big smiler. So every time I smile, which is 95.5% of the time, Pushes them out. the earbud wants to fall out. And I'm like, look, listen, I have one hand for the mouse and it's on the same side as the earbud is in. Like, can we work together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just got, but, I just got new, new AirPods as well. And yeah, the earbuds kind of, they don't stay in. Maybe I need the smaller tip thing, but. Exactly. We'll I think we need on the, on another segment when we have you on is we need to redesign the ear pods ergonomically yeah. economically sound where yeah. when we actually spend money they stay in our ears totally <laughs> totally agree could not agree more <laughs> um i just pulled i don't know if people have used this plugin before but it's called icons for design and you just download it and then there's a bunch of different icons available to you which is super helpful you also can use other websites like the noun project um you can download icons for free but sometimes i typically first start with this like icons for design plugin see if there's any good ones there and then i will check out the noun project if there's not any that fit the aesthetic exactly. icons for design is like a lifesaver usually we we all designers get in that moment where it's like we have this amazing idea for our design and we just need that one icon but then we have to leave xd which is a teardropper to begin with because we yeah. have to leave the application that we all know, love, and admire. Right. And then we have to go to other platforms to get that one icon or that set that at yeah. least looks similar to our vision. And it's just all, it's a saddening process because then we forget that we're supposed to go back to our project in Adobe XD and then now we're on YouTube and <laughs> you get distracted. <laughs> the ADD commences. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, so something I'm also doing here is I've noticed like with apps like Uber, they have two separate apps, one for drivers and one for um, people who are being picked up. Mm. For this one, I want it to be both in one. So I want to have um, the experience for cooks, so people who are actually starting this food business, but then also people to actually order food. So that's why I have two different mm. kind of calls to action here for cooks. So that's gonna be the onboarding experience for them. And then for diners, that'll be the onboarding experience for them. So we're gonna do the cooks onboarding onboarding experience today perfect yeah so so i kind of got this to where go ahead what no you got this to where i was about to ask you a question that led you down what you were about to talk about so <laughs> yeah so so when we're thinking about onboarding so this is like when you first download the app and you're like creating an account or getting started um so obviously the first thing you need to do is sign up for something like this um, like if you're starting a food business you need to create your account so the first page is gonna be that sign up um page so super simple it's just like sign up email phone number and then that creates your account so that's what we're gonna do on this page something i'd love to do too is I kind of want these photos on this second screen to pull up um, over here and I'll, I'll try to mimic what I mean right now. So I'm gonna just copy this screen and I'm gonna start getting rid of things. Maybe move them. 
I like. I had a question that totally, actually, while you're doing that, I want the yeah. other side of your brain to work on this question. Cause I know, okay. it, I, I remember when I first guested, like I, Howard was so patient with me. It was very hard <laughs> to be like, all right, I'm about to explain what I'm about to do. And then a question came in and then it just like, my brain got cut in half. But <laughs> when you're ready, <laughs> the next I'm question ready. is, we have in the chat, let me get the name of this. Chris is asking, um, do you know any good books on typography or have you, yeah, do you have any recommendations on that? I don't, unfortunately. I So I didn't go to design school, so I feel like I would have had a bunch of resources that way. Um, but I feel like I've seen this book and I can picture it in my brain, but I don't know what it's called. I feel like it's almost just called Type. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it probably is. I think I know exactly it, what you're talking about. Do you know what I mean? It has like huge, it's huge bold letters, Type, like beautiful yeah. book. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I do not. Something that I love though, a resource I love to look at about type is, that's a website, is called Type Wolf. Have you heard of that one before? Yes, I love yes. that one, yeah. So they curate like tons and tons of different websites that have really cool type combinations. They also yeah. like highlight Adobe fonts. So if you have mm -hmm. a Creative Cloud subscription, you get Adobe fonts for included. Um, so you can see like what's the closest seeming Adobe font available and then what's a good pairing for that one. So that's what I would recommend starting with. Yeah. Do you I, have any ones? That one, I do. And I'm trying to like go through because I actually learned it through um, Type Wolf. And I cool. always used to, oh, I just magically hovered over it. See, I think you were guiding me towards it. It's called uh, <laughs> Fonts in Use where because my thing is and I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this where it's like somebody who wasn't textbook taught yeah your taste level brought you into the game i call it the game like we're in the streets or something we're in a rap <laughs> video now um <laughs> love it but um what's we call it uh we learn through oh that looks good how can i make that how what was the process of somebody who made something like that I would assume that sort of thought process is what got you to doing what yeah. you're doing today. It's a very simple thought process. You're like, I like this. It looks nice. How can I do it? Totally. And, yeah. And yeah, I think that's I think one. Yeah. It's, go ahead. It's, what do you think about that? I feel like I start a lot with inspiration. Like I know I'm, I'm sure you spent a lot of time in Dribble. I spent a lot of time on Dribble, Behance, all those websites, like seeing what people can do is right. so inspiring. And then trying to recreate that. I feel like that is exactly. such a good way to learn. You know? Yeah. Like, like how some do you... people, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and finish the thought. Yeah, like I, like I saw, you know, in my mood board here, I had this little like, this kind of looks similar, right? It didn't have a mm -hmm. parallax effect, but I it sparked my imagination. I was like, oh, what if that had like a cool parallax effect and could yeah. we incorporate that into the experience, you know? So little things like that yeah. can trigger, it's like a neural connection, you know, like can trigger some inspiration in your brain and then you'll recreate it. It's like, it's a lot, it's a different type of puzzle. It's all the things that we really like, right? That the taste brings us to like, that looks awesome. That looks awesome. That looks awesome. And then we, when we have like 15, 20, or maybe, I don't know, two to, or maybe three to 20 things that really inspire us. And we are all, you know, for each thing we're questioning about, oh, how do we make that? Yeah. We then pull those things together and mix and match them and come out with something that has, bits and pieces of all those things that we were inspired by but in our through our own skill sets ability and what we envisioned we put something new together i think yeah. that is creativity like that that's to me that's what it means but i feel like some people actually get stuck with uh, because i think there's the you know the textbook reader right but there's nothing wrong with that that's just one way to get into <laughs> quote unquote, the game, um, or the game. Into creating things. <laughs> yeah, the game. Um, but then you also have people who are driven by taste and really they're aspiring to is not to learn something, but to make something. And by being driven by wanting to create that thing, they're having to learn a whole bunch of things um, on yeah. the journey to create that one thing that they sought to make or that they were inspired by. So I think it's interesting to always go down uh, those two rabbit holes where it's like you learned to make versus you wanted to make and then you learned yeah. how to do so. Totally. Um, it two and it takes roles. time. It's like to get super comfortable takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. So 
yeah. to all the beginners out there. It's like, just keep doing it. <laughs> you know, that's why hundred day projects are really cool. You know, where like you just do something for a hundred days, like a new, yeah. I've seen like a lot of people do like the daily creative challenge, even, even that, you know, doing that every day is really, really helpful. Exactly. And we have a really cool one today. We have augmented reality right after this, ladies and gentlemen, with Howard. But before we get into that, we have a couple more questions. Voodoo yeah. Val popped into the chat, uh, Type Wolf. I'm also going to pop in the link for the, um, when I find it again, because I'm now not hovered onto it. But we have a couple more questions. And also, before we yeah. do that, Patricia mentioned some books to take a look at. We have Thinking with Type, a critical guide. She's the for resource designers. queen. <laughs> She's got all oh. all the resources for you. <laughs> Patricia is right now watching uh, Adobe Live like, all right, let me go to my notebook. And she <laughs> is. She's absolutely amazing. Um, there was one further up. We had Ran ask, have you experienced... Wait, hold on a second. Da -da -da, let me read this. Let me see. Actually, that is... Here. Julie, I'm really new to UX design and stuff. Can you recommend to me what course or sort of information should I practice daily? I think we kind of answered that just right there, but is there any um, more granularity that you'd like to get into for that particular question? And that was asked by uh, Sahil, I believe the. Yeah. Is. Yeah, there's a ton of different ways that you can kind of get started. Um, there are a lot of like online class course platforms like Skillshare and Udemy um, mm -hmm. that you can check out. There's a lot of like UX courses, I think there as well. Um, otherwise, like joining a daily, daily creative challenge or even a creative jam that's happening virtually, that's another great opportunity to get started. Everyone's super nice and like super open to helping and helping you learn. So don't be afraid yeah. to join one of those. Um, but yeah, otherwise like courses, those Skillshare, you to me, I think you have some courses, right? Brandon on there. Uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> okay. I was like, Is, do I had to ask myself like internally like what just happened. And maybe you just recommended like, a couple courses or something on Instagram. That I yeah. Saw. I, re I recommend, um, I forget the name, but this is, uh, I'm going to be put on the spot. They're gonna be like, how do you promote <laughs> that? And you don't know the guy's name. I'm like, I'm blanking right now. I'm super, I'm in, that's how, you know, I'm a present person. I'm like, we're here with Julie right now. We're, we're trying to discuss a very important topic and we're looking at how to make beautiful food apps, but <laughs> it will come back to me as we go in further into our journey today. I believe we still have quite a bit of time. Um, oh, and thank you so much, Voodoo, putting fonts in use. See, this is also how bad my memory is. I said it and forgot what the website was. And I was like, I don't even know what it is right now. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for putting that in the, in the chat, uh, Val. But I wanted to go back to, um, and also let me know if I'm asking 21 and five questions and you're like, Brandon, just like two, two seconds of like solace. So I can put these, no, arrange these good. images really quick. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting things that we can talk about here because there's two things that you mentioned, uh, or really one, but a lot of things spiraled into my mind that I think are, is very interesting. Um, cause I do talk and I'm, you know, I do talk to a lot of creatives and a large portion of their concern is, and even with the question you answered previously is where do I start? What exactly do I need to learn? At what point do I have the necessary knowledge in order to be seen as experienced? Um, yeah. I think is the primary question because I think in the world that we're slight, I, I don't want to put any um, labels, but just thinking with you in the chat here as uh, potentialities of um, things to think about. <clears throat> in the hackathon that you were in, you yeah. were presented an opportunity to present to people who were looking for minds that had potential. Um, you had, and in order for them to, whatever that potential in their mind was, was somebody with a capability to produce what it is that they were looking for. And in most people, that's like, we don't know. We're just in the, in, in your case scenario, you were like, I'm just going to do my best in this case scenario to show my potential. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest things to keep in mind when you're at like a hackathon or some interview or things like that is confidence 
in yourself and like your ability and capability. Um, even mm. if you don't feel like you have those tangible skills yet, but mostly it's like a willingness to learn and an excitement to learn. That's like what people are looking for when you're like a beginner um, and maybe don't have experiences. Like, are you willing to learn and we'll put in the hard work for it? Um, mm -hmm. And are you excited? Like, is this going to be something that you're passionate about? Um, yeah, yeah, I feel like those are the two big things to keep in mind during those kinds of events. Yeah, ag agreed. And I even think there's a mindset to be taken from that as well. The the hard work and be able to put in the extra work that wasn't necessarily asked for. I had a, um, uh, I mean, not just this one student, but in particular, because you even used your example of, I, man, Brandon, I had to cancel my, my trip to Chile. Was it Chile? Yeah. Yep. Uh, you, I had to cancel my, my trip. And um, what I hear from, you know, and I'm sure it's different contexts, right? On Instagram where it, all the designers are like, no free work. But then they turn around and they're like, why don't I have work? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, what, first off, what do you think about that? like that whole concept there I, in different contexts is that that phrase free work can be different so that's also a hard thing but what do you think yeah. about that totally that's a really good question i think you like yourself have to decide am i like gaining something valuable out of doing this work if it's not paid you know um like mm. whether it's a connection or whether it's like really really fun honestly to do i think if yeah. you decide that those two things are true like i'm getting a good connection or i'm getting exposure that could lead to something or um it's just really fun to do then like i say just do it you know um mm -hmm. but at the same time you have to like everyone needs to make a living and creators should be paid for their work so if you're ever asked for like during an interview for a file or like something that you put a lot of work into, like you don't want just someone to take your work and then say no to you to, for a job, you know? So it's kind of, it's a hard balance to, to achieve for sure. But I don't know. What do you yeah. think about that? I think it, it, like you said, it's a, it's a challenging because there's two ways it can be uh, used, but I think I, I, when people talk to me, they're like, Brandon, you never provide answers. You always talk in questions. And I'm like, well, I don't have the answer. I'm posing questions for us to think about. So hopefully um, it's not my job to give answers um, because the answer in a certain situation might not be when the situation that I'm in with certain variables and what I do, mm -hmm. my actions, my answer might be totally different in what your context is. So yeah. um, before I answer that question, let's just bookmark this because there are some uh, questions in cool. the chat. Well, actually, let me answer it, then we'll jump into this because I'll forget what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> the dilemma. <laughs> um, but my quick questioned answer is that if someone is concerned about work, but they're presented with opportunities where if they do really good free work, they have either gained a relationship, the potential for um, really for example i've done a lot of free work and unasked for work in order mm -hmm. to capitalize on an opportunity that totally. wasn't really asked for so like there was something that i saw that wasn't happening for example but you know these people obviously needed something because uh someone was trying to create something right but they were either falling short or they could have done better so yeah. you ask or you, you ask somebody is this something of interest to you or improving on this of interest to you if they say yes with their own words then you provide a solution and um obvious like i would already have the answer i would just have or the the solution i would just ask if they needed it i've made yeah. it all in the background i spent like eight hours whatever making it ask them if they if this something like this was something they need they say yes and i'm like oh well i already have it and they're like, oh, people are blown away by that. People sh will, people want to know that you care before that, before they care, which is really right. interesting. Right. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah. I think that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I know friends who have um, done exactly that and then gotten a job out of it, you know, like a full-time job or even like a, yeah. a freelance job. So, and if you had fun doing it, then. Exactly. And I think experience. the, yeah, the fun has to be part of it like 
it's hard to do that if first off the thing that you're making for eight hours that wasn't even asked for in the opportunity you saw was not yeah. fun. Um, yeah. I wouldn't do that either. All right. Because what if they <laughs> said no? You know, like we don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're like, what did I just do for eight hours? <laughs> Well, ho hopefully, um, hopefully someone did, or I always do enough information to one, I, there's criteria. One, do I like this company? Two, what are the opportunities? Um, there's like a whole tr thing of uh, train of thought that I have to go through. Do I like the yeah. company? Awesome. Um, what is there of opportunity for me um, or to do together? Oh, well, it looks like they're trying to do this. I wonder if they're um, interested in doing this w one level up. Ask them. Totally. Sure make it in the background. By the way, the last conversation that we had two days ago, here it is. Is this something that you are would like to continue doing? And they're like, most of the time it's been yeses because I've done my uh, upfront research and qualified they are interested in something like this. But all right, there's like four or five questions building up in the chat. Let's get to these. All right, let's get to it. <laughs> all right. Um, first off, Lisa, awesome. You are from Belgium and you're starting to learn XD. First off, five claps from both me and Julie the same. She can't clap right now because- I had to count. And mouse. <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura says, I love typography, but doesn't, uh, da, da. limited choices in typography. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, actually, let me see. I, I mean, Laura, I mean, uh, Julie, do you yeah. feel that there's a limited selection of your typography? And if this is a question, what would you, how would you answer that? If they're thinking that this typography is like a limited selection, how do you continue to find new typography that you like and continue to use in your projects or even go and find these things? So like a limited typography, like as a UX designer? Yeah, well, I'm assuming that this question is related to, um, but doesn't work in a format for digital device. Yeah. So I'm assuming from this question, the typography that they want to use is limited based on uh, the device, device type. actually. Or having the font. Um, I or having I think the font. Maybe I'm not. There is one distinction of like, does this font look good on print versus does this font mm. look good digitally? So that's something I need to learn more about, to be honest with you. Um, but that is, I know, one big distinction is like, that's why like with newspapers a lot, you see serif fonts, um, whereas on websites, you see more sans serif fonts. Uh, so that's a, it's a good question. But I think there are a lot of, I think even Adobe Fonts has a, you know, top 20 fonts that look good on a screen. So you can check out something like that for some font inspiration. But I bet you those books go into, you know, how to do that. <laughs> Things like that. I, yeah, I think with you, most likely, I mean, with a, I know exactly what you're talking about. That book with, this is what I think is funny, though. I'm like, why would I read a book? Actually, I couldn't say that. Can I say that? Um, I'm like, why would I, for type that I use digitally, why would I look to a book to tell me what type to use when I can look at what we were talking about earlier. We look at digital things for inspiration because we're building digital things. Um, right. And granted, you know, not to say that digital uses of print can't inspire uh, something that you're doing digitally, but yeah. using things that we see in, to inform what we want to make. Uh, so we're like, oh, what is that? Luckily, just online, um, we have the ability to be like, oh, we like this font that's on such and such website, we go to inspect elements, see what they're using, yes. and we can go and download that. But we can't do that to a font, no matter how many times you right click, or uh, to a font that's in a book, no matter how many times you right click it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unless, there you go. Yeah. Unless, yeah, I do that a lot, yeah. like inspecting, like when I find a really mm -hmm. cool website that I'm like, wow, those fonts are super cool. Even the combinations, I'll inspect it and then check out hope a lot of times the fonts are like expensive to buy so i don't buy them but they're still fun to look at gotcha um something i'm doing here which for those of you who are new to xd is i made a component which basically allows you to do a bunch of things one of which is have different states so like when you have a um button for example you'd have an unselected state you'd have a selected state 
Um, if you're on working on like a website, so not a mobile app, you'd have maybe a hover state. Um, mm -hmm. So I just clicked Command K, and that's how you make a component. You see a component by this like little green box that's, that appears around it. And then you can adjust the um, different states on the right hand properties panel. So I created a selected state, which shows up as black with a check mark in it. And then I have my default state. So I'm going to delete that check mark so you can see. So now I can go back and forth. Have you ever used like components within components in your projects? Yes. I'm trying to think of an exact use case I've used that, but I definitely have used nested components before. I can't think of like a specific example, <laughs> but definitely comes in handy. <laughs> It definitely does, especially if you're using the same thing. Um, what's it called? The same icon or it, asset, basically, in yeah. whatever way that you've formatted it. If you use it across different projects, it's a great, great thing to use. Um, totally. Back to Julio or Julio's question. I'm, it's either Julio or Julio. I apologize. Um, their question was related, I think. Let me see. Actually, it's Laura. Going back to Laura first, then Julio or Julio, whichever. <laughs> we'll answer the, both questions. Okay. Laura was asking, digital verse print in the size of the device as a limiting factor um, is what I was asking. Great question. Um, Julie, now with the refined question, do you believe that the device is a limiting factor For, in your type choice? In my type choice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... To an extent, yes. So if you have, I mean, it, it kind of, I feel like it just depends what size type you're using, right? And what weight okay. type, you're, what weight is available. Like a lot of the fonts yeah. I choose, I find specific fonts with a lot of different weights. So I have mm -hmm. that flexibility to work with. Some fonts, it is true, you know, have only one weight. So it's like super thick yeah. or super thin, let's say. So that, I guess, could be considered a limiting factor. Like if you can only if it's best to work with fonts that have a ton of different weight options, that could be limiting. I hope that answers yeah. your question. <laughs> I hope it answers your question, Laura. If not, just repurpose the question again and we'll go <laughs> back at it. We have, we're here for another hour, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we um, got it. Yeah, so, so I just added- just Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I just added on some, a little quick component animation in here. And luckily, since I added the animation on this one, since it's a component, it automatically adjusts on this one as well, which is fun. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, and now you, oh, excuse, we're like politely uh, <laughs> trying not to push each other's mics. I like this. Um, <laughs> we're like, oh, excuse me, Brad. Oh, Julie. I'm part it's of so it. hard on Zoom so. sometimes, you know, like when you're in other <laughs> Zoom meetings, you're like, oh, I spoke over you by accident. No, I, when you're in the studio in person, it's like, we just like, can, you know, it's it just flows. harder. Remotely. Yeah. But it's funny though. It's always have you been on those Zoom meetings where it's like everybody does the interval pauses where it's just like some everybody's like and then they wait five seconds and then they yep. all just come back in again and it's just like all right, we, we need to raise our hands in Zoom. And yep. <laughs> yep. Someone go yeah. Um, all right, let's see. Talent in the chat says by font support type designers. Voodoo Val says this. I also in agreement. Um we agree. let's see. Yeah, and some some fonts are not that expensive, and then you get to own them forever, which is pretty awesome. Exactly. All right, Laura says my question has been answered. Virtual <laughs> thumbs up. Awesome, Laura. Beautiful. All right, let us go to Julio. Um, let's see, Julie. Would you rec? What would you recommend in regards to learning UX design? Now, I know you've already answered this previously in we're going to take another we're going to i'm going to ask another question because you answered this a little bit earlier in okay the stream where you've learned to do you said skillshare you do me all that stuff but i think it's really interesting and we've also talked about um your well we haven't really that you're self-taught so in yeah. regards to the resources whether that's youtube udemy skillshare whatnot how do you with the knowledge you've gained, how do you apply it? What is your, what did you have to do in between learning, doing something that helped you 
work with who you're working with now, whether that's Microsoft, um, IDEO, like how, what did you have to put into practice with the knowledge that you learned from these um, resources? Feel free to list them again, but like, what did you have to do in order to work with who you work with today? Yeah, I know that that's a long tail. Yeah. It's more like story time, but what did you yeah. have to do with the knowledge you learned to get to where you are today? Yeah. So, I mean, a big important thing is to have a portfolio. So actually show the work that you do. That's kind of a beautiful thing about the design industry is it's not about what yeah. degree you have or like where you went to, mm -hmm. where you went to school, where you grew up, nothing like that. It's like, what work do you have to show and why are you passionate about what you're passionate about? Um, so once I, you know, taught myself and like kept on working, kept on going, um, I started making like case studies and portfolio pieces, which there's a lot of courses about those too. Like how do you create a good portfolio piece um, or even a right. case study on Behance? And that showcases your whole process. So not just the end product of the design that you often see on things like Dribbble, but it goes right. through like, what did you, what was, what was the why behind this project? How did you do research if you did research? Um, and then how did you make those certain design decisions along the way? So that's kind of that next step. Like once you've learned some stuff, started creating a thing, then you want to put it all together and wrap it up with a bow in like a case study or a portfolio piece. And that's what like people who are giving you jobs or looking at your work are seeing. So that's what I would recommend. Gotcha. And I think that's a great recommendation because I think that's one thing our skill set or our uh, our work, yeah, our, our basically in the industry that we work in, our work is visual. Um, you yeah. have other types of skill sets where it is very, it, the way that you show your skill set is not visual. You have to show up, go do something. And uh, it looks very different, but we are lucky in our industry and in our type of work, we are very easily able to showcase the knowledge that we have in our minds and uh, our capability basically. And that's what people, we were talking about earlier, that's what people hire for capability yeah. um, and potential. Even if I, I talk to some people and um, that are, you know, creatives, and I would like to hear what your thoughts are on this too. If you know some individuals um, you've talked to in the space where they're like, hey, where do I learn about UI UX? And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I give the, the obvious answers that anybody else would. Uh, books, yeah. YouTube, Udemy, yada, yada, yada. And totally. where you, yeah, where you learn, or w what would you say, where you learn really doesn't necessarily matter. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think you could even just be learning from a friend who is mm -hmm. a designer, for example. Um, you know, it, it's, it's where you learn best as well. So I think figuring that out, like I'm very much a learn by doing kind of person. So yeah. Like you said, like I, I won't read all the books out there. I'll often just like be working and um, learning by doing, and that's how I learn along the way. So I think it's like figuring out what you, how you learn the best is a first step, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, that makes sense. But I always, <laughs> my question rather than an answer, how does one learn without doing? Yeah. That's when, yeah. <laughs> Learn without you know, doing. How do you, how, is that possible? And if so, and I would love to know from the chat, like, do you guys think that is possible? If so, I would love to hear your responses. Well, but I mean, to that, to that, there, what, do you, what would you say, Julie? There is a study that I've learned about in school at some point that was about basketball. And it was mm -hmm. that you could, it, they basically compared people who played basketball every day to mm -hmm. people who watched basketball games every day yeah. and like the people who watched the games and didn't practice every day actually were almost as good it was like 80 percent or something like that in terms of performance so even people watching a live stream like this you're not doing yeah. anything necessarily but you are inherently learning like you're seeing how i work you know what we talk about what we think about um, so even if you're not like making yourself, you're still kind of processing behind the scenes. Right. If that makes sense. And what, what, so with those two variables, what happens to the person that does both? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I would assume it would be 
you'd you'd be a hundred percent there, you know, like you're <laughs> you got yeah. half and half of the pie. You bring them together, there's basically a whole pie. Full pie, exactly. Um yeah, I mean I think that's the best case scenario. You know, like you're able to absorb, but then also mm-hmm. the opposite of absorb. Like give. <laughs> um like yeah. work and create Apply. things. Apply. Yeah. There you go. Um yeah. I, I I think there's two ways that you could do it for sure. Because yeah, I've heard that um, study before, and I feel like it was, I think it has great use, but I feel like it's the variable that is also very important that it doesn't touch on. And it's like, what happens to the individual? And you would think the people doing this test would at least have in the third group where it's like they did both. <laughs> right, right, right. But, yeah, I don't um, think I don't think they did. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, why would you push people to do either or if there's a, yeah. the potential to have an even greater capability by learning doing and doing? I want to yeah. be that person. Why was that? Me too. <laughs> why was that variable withheld? Yeah. Um, it's probably harder to, to study, I would assume. Maybe it's probably gets the wires crossed. So you have to do a black and white study. Yeah. Um, because how do you say, Sally or Tim, you you have three hours to learn this stuff on Udemy and then you got three hours to make it. Uh, <laughs> like, there, you there you go. It gets really weird. Um, let's make all it. Julio says, thank you. I didn't listen to that part earlier, but it's good to know what she said. Awesome. Glad we were able to answer that. Hey, what's going on, Reverb, Reverb Mike? What's happening? Reverb says, I could watch weightlifting every day and never lift 500 pounds. <laughs> never say <laughs> no a, to pie. <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting one. You know, that's true. Huh. That study doesn't well, apply. Well, but see, that's what I was saying. I was like, I think they have two very good and accurate points made, but I feel like it's very, there was a narrative that wanted to be played because there's, there's still the person. Applications. Yeah, I think it was great to know and interesting yeah. to be like, oh, well, these people who just learned, um, you know, where, uh, you know, who just watched basketball were able to perform uh, better than the people who played every day. And I'm like, well, we need to know the data behind who was playing, because if they were, um, <laughs> you know, if they found the worst players on the court and they were like, look, listen, we're going to get LeBron James and um, everybody, <laughs> everybody else to just watch basketball. And of course they, um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to know the I, details, the, the fine yeah, print. I need to know the details because <laughs> then the question, just like uh, Mike was asking, I'm like, well, I like to watch football and trust me when a football, actually, I don't watch football. That is a total lie. Every football <laughs> that's come towards me, it's caused me a black eye and that's not even a lie. I have pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do we call it um yeah it's, it's an interesting study and i think it's great to be like oh that's interesting but what can i do if i did both sides of the equation yeah i think i think my gut tells me that both sides is even better you know being able yeah. to i i truly believe in learning by doing um like mm-hmm. i don't think you can just watch what other people do and learn but like you'll learn techniques that's a great way to like refine techniques and learn tricks tips yeah. and tricks um so like if you're watching those weightlifting videos you probably will learn how to lift weights properly but maybe not you don't have the muscle strength to lift 500 pounds immediately but the technique yes. maybe is more the side of it like what's uh what's really funny <clears throat> is you can't tell now but i was I have, i'm brown belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu we don't have to talk about this ah. but um I used to be super thick way back in the day, not like like super muscular. When I show my friends um, the size I was back then, um, they were like, what? <laughs> they were like, what were you doing? Like what kind of protein powder? Or like, how are you lifting weights? And they think I knew this. And I was just like, <laughs> I pick them up and put them down. I have no idea. <laughs> I just, I, I, yeah. But I think it's interesting where I had no idea how to lift weights, but what? Well, my dad was a bodybuilder, so I guess I grew up Whoa. doing that. I never took a, a, fun a fact. class or whatever. Fun fact, yes. Um, but it was interesting never like doing a class or a YouTube and just doing what I saw him do, picking things up and putting things down. While my friends were like, listen, Brandon, the way that you're doing that bench, it's not at a 45 degree angle. And uh, the way that your shin, I'm like, and they're like, arch your back. I'm like, no, I don't, <laughs> don't need to know all that. <laughs> Um, anyway, they, they, I'm trying to refer that back to the topic. It has nothing to do with weights, 
um, or pie or anything else that we're we're trying to do in in chat here. But um, there was, yeah, I forgot my my question. But um, how how are we doing? What are we what are we up to? Yeah. Okay, so we're basically done with the onboarding flow. I wanted to keep it super simple and light. I might add some flair tomorrow, um, but just a little quick run through. So yeah. we have this fun parallax flow. And then when you click on four cooks, I need to mess around with that animation so that it fades nicely. Add a, probably a black box behind the first two screens. Um, I haven't wired up this screen yet, but this is where we have sign up, and then where are you located? So there's only three questions that will be part of the sign up flow. Um, yeah. And I like to incorporate like, you know, oftentimes you start forms or like surveys and you're like, how long is this actually gonna take me? And then it takes like an hour. <laughs> so I like to be clear <laughs> upfront with how long this is gonna take. So you're at step one of three. So it's gonna be super fast. Um, so for this, it's important to ask where are you located? So where will you be cooking? Um, this is more logistical. So your kitchen space. So do I have a kitchen or do I need a kitchen? So some people maybe don't want to cook in their own home. So that could be a separate flow where we have maybe connects you to a restaurant that's open that you can use your kitchen or someone else who has a permitted kitchen space. But we're going to go with the I have a kitchen flow. Then the last is certification. So we're we're using California in mind. So that's where you can get a permit to use your home kitchen. So that's what a Miko kitchen is, M-E-H-K-O. I don't know what it stands yep. for to be honest, but that's I like guess home certified kitchen. And then I have a commissary of commercial kitchen. So this is just like a quick three-step flow. And then this is your like let's get going page. So this is an an illustration I pulled in from Adobe Stock. What's, yes. I love playing with illustrations in my work. I don't know why, it's, I'm just always drawn to it. Um, it feels like super homey to me. Yeah. So, homey, that's <laughs> home E with a Y. Uh, <laughs> so this is an illustration you can see, it's like all vector-based, so I can, I can play around with like, if I wanted to change her apron color, I can do that. Um, so oh, that's wait, what I what? love. Hold up, back it up. Yeah. Look, that, was, that was literally some voodoo magic right there. Yeah, so you just click it and then you just play around and then, yeah, you can mess around. assets, play. like photo assets mm. from, um, that's awesome. I had no idea. Like I knew yeah. you could do that from Adobe or not, uh, what is it? The icons for design, like obviously you could use. Right. Whatnot, but I had no idea you could change the colors. Yeah, and you also can change something I've done a lot, which maybe if we have time, I can do this tomorrow. But with this being vector, I can animate her cutting just by playing around with like the different points. You know, I've done that a lot in work and I'm sure you'd love that because you like animation. But that's a really <laughs> fun, Julie. a really fun thing to do. It's so, like you can move this around and then play around with her hand so it looks like she's cutting on this page. So if we have time, we'll get to that. Ooh. Guys, yeah. stay tuned. That means you have to sit and watch if you want that nice, delicious animation from Julie. Yeah. Chopping, what are we chopping? Celery? I have no idea. Don't eat. I think it. it's. I think it's celery. I'm not positive. Celery. All right. Pos well, yeah. we're here today on Adobe Live. We got celery. <laughs> just to show you, this is like what I downloaded from stock. So it's just this. It pulls up in Illustrator, and then you literally just drag it over into XD. And with XD being super fast, like it just it just works beautifully. Um, wow. so if that loads, I'll show you, but that's, that's typically what I will play around with is those illustrations. That's awesome. So yeah, a nice tip. I'm excited. Guys, I'm is. also in the audience here today. <laughs> <laughs> I too. Um, hold on. I'm looking at the chat here. I think we're fighting about pie. Um, let's see. Voodoo is like, don't, or, uh, Voodoo is like, don't at me. I don't like chocolate. Um, and uh -oh. we have uh, Kyle Mack talking about burritos over pie. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, I am all kinds of lactose intolerant and would, I would, you know, burritos and, and pie fall into the lactose intolerant category, but I would much love pie over a burrito any day. I like extra cheese. Anyways, mm. all right, back to you, Julie. <laughs> With, <laughs> no, I think your good. stories are better than mine. I, I think we're learning stuff from you and Brandon's just like, let's talk about, let's no, talk about the food he ate you've today that is not energy. good. We're good. So we bring that fire. Yeah, we bring that fire. Um, 
I just finished the onboarding flow. So now I'm going to start with like, what is the home experience? So again, we're talking about, for those of you who hopped on, we're making a pop-up restaurant app. So the user here is like, I'm a chef or I'm a home cook and I want to start my own food business. So now, you know, it's, it's hard to, as just a general person, it's hard to know like what restaurant managing apps look like, you know, like, mm. but from my experience working as a host in a restaurant when I was like 16, they're really, really clunky and just outdated. It's just like a black screen with like bright green text, right? Mm. That's like yeah. order one, this, this, this. Um, so I want to modernize that and make it um, super usable and simple at the same time. So when I'm thinking of something like a pop-up restaurant, um, you're running these pop-ups every day, likely, or a couple yeah. times a week. So the main thing I want to focus on is the calendar. Mm -hmm. So what are my orders for today, tomorrow, the next day, and so on? Yeah. And then I want to look at active orders. So I'm cooking tonight or tomorrow. What are my orders that I have already placed? Then obviously like what's my menu yeah and then what am i making so the goal here is to make a living so what are my earnings <laughs> and then is that going to be an option i want to make a living <laughs> dear god <laughs> <laughs> click <laughs> um and then profile so about me like some photos of my food stuff like that um could be within here so this is the behind gotcha. the scenes like from the chef side of things so yeah just to talk about structure of projects as well like i think first about my navigation so like what's my navigation going to be that helps me mm -hmm. decide like okay i'm gonna have a calendar active orders menu earnings profile so five different options that's typically where i start and i'll pull in like some fun icons i already pulled in some here that so I'm going to draw from, wow. you know, we just like to have things downloaded and these honestly don't super match. And so sometimes like this, you know, the weight of this icon's much thicker than this one. So I often will just like play around with the actual points in XD mm. to try to match it as much as possible. Um, but if you can find like font uh, icons that are in a set, that is like the most ideal. Yes. Typically. But we're just going to make this one work because that's what we got. That's like professional. For me, I'm just like, all right, these don't match, but let's hit that stroke, <laughs> stroke feature. I'm just like, everything's fat today. I know. Um, but, yeah. Well, real quick, guys, if you guys are really enjoying what Julie is putting together here and you're having some laughs, you're enjoying what we're doing, even if it's just about the burritos and pie in the chat. Don't forget to hit the like button, whether you are on YouTube or in Behance. But if you're on YouTube, come join the conversation over on Behance. The link, we should have Voodoo Val giving you guys a link over on YouTube. Come on, join the Adobe Live family and come chat with us here. I don't know if you use this a lot, but I love using the like quick, I don't know. I don't know if it's a shortcut, but like these spacers. So like if I want things to be centered together and then spaced evenly apart, I just like click that button on the right hand side and it's super fast and easy. So this is now I'm just doing like my navigation. I love it. That's really interesting. I've, I've not, um, what's we call it? <clears throat> I don't know. I'm a huge advocate for purchasing or buying assets nowadays. People are always like, <laughs> I was gonna yell. There's a couple people in the chat from um, from my Game Changers community. It's a, anyways, a creative community. But they, we have a whole bunch of UI UX designers. And when I go live, they're like, Brandon, why don't you ever make your assets? And I'm like, look, listen. In today's day and age, we don't get paid for, or people. What people would rather pay for is their problem to be solved. You would agree? Yes. And I would agree. so the no matter how amazing or delicious or uh an asset is granted you can upcharge for um if you're a boutique and that's just something that um there's a lot of variables in this so i'm not giving a blanket answer but in this situation where people are like why don't you ever create your assets i'm like well there's uh, you know, storefronts digitally where I can buy the assets that I need for $25, $50. How much time does that save me? Uh, versus 
how much I cost an hour, how much am I costing my own business by spending my hour to create that thing? Totally. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, how do you, with your work, do you find yourself, you're creating stuff um, more from scratch or buying things? And also, again, it depends on what type of client you're working with. Um, yeah. yeah Two-part question. I think question. it Sorry. depends. No, go for it. Like with your people that you work with, whether you're your clients, your, 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 your job, do you tend to work with already created assets and you just work on the thinking side of things and how to solve the problem? Or are you working on both the creative portion and the problem solving? And uh, let's just start with those two questions. And I got a third one packed. This <laughs> packed, ready to go. Yeah, I feel like I focus a lot on the problem solving and also like high level strategy too. Um, so like everything I make, whether it's a personal project or a client project, like yeah. if it's a client project, you're working on something real, right? That's like out there and, and happening or is about to be. So obviously the problem solving and usability and so on is super important. Even my personal projects that are more conceptual, I do think about like if I brought this to life one day, um, what's the strategy about that? So trying to make it or from the frame of mind of like, this is going to be a real thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so with assets, yeah. Like I think I, I feel like I pull a lot of assets from online. Um, it is really important to support creators who are focusing on building those assets. So yeah. super, super into that. Um, and for clients specifically, oftentimes like I'll recommend certain assets to buy. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll include them in like my mock-ups or things like that and be like, this is where this is from. So if you like it, we can buy it from here, yada, yada. So does that, yeah. does that, no, make that sense? answers the, yeah, that answers the question. It actually also clarifies, um, I guess the question a little bit better because there's people who get paid for creative and then there's people in the UI UX industry where we're getting paid to solve a business challenge. It just so happens it's through creative and uh through creative solutions where the the things tie so i, I also don't want to um dismiss the people who get paid handsomely also for doing um creative work because that's what they do the client is coming to them to create something beautiful but then yeah. sometimes you only get approached to through your ui ux knowledge to hey we have this problem within our sales funnel if you guys don't know what that is it's basically you know if you're dealing with mcdonald's um on mobile app and they're like, people get lost at checkout. They don't come back. We keep making fries and people aren't getting them. <laughs> you know, they're just, <laughs> I don't know what the scenario would be. But we have a digital problem and we need it to be solved through um, visual and a strategic, um, it, through strategic means. So you're, the job of a designer is to think of a, cr a creative way to solve the problem. That's first. And then in the back, like still make it. Uh, appease them on the visual aspect of that right uh, totally yeah. yeah and some people also are hired to do like just research or like do an audit mm -hmm. of someone's website like right. i created this website and i don't know how good it is so can you come in and help me figure that out <laughs> you know right so yeah it really i think totally depends yeah there's so many pieces of the pie and this is also we're, i'm continuously tying it back because this is how people can get lost um, especially when starting with, hey, or the question of how do I learn UI UX design? And I think it's important to also add to the end of that question, to what end do you want to be, where do you want to be or be doing with your knowledge? So I think yeah. it's important because if you, you can learn 512 ways of being a UI UX designer, but how are you applying that? Do you want to work with people who just want to do really creative stuff and very little, um, you know, they want some UX, but that's really not the case in point. Or do you want to be working with people just through research? And what type yeah. of research does that look like? Analysis, whatever. Um, if you want to be doing that, well, you only have to read these few books rather than the 500 and 12. Like being very precise about what you want to do before you go out and learn. Yeah, totally. Would you agree with that or how would yeah. you, how would you I think that? Also, some people don't know what they, you know, like what their goals are and what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like just getting started is the best way. Like you're your kind of biggest roadblock. Like I feel like oftentimes 
it's so easy to be like, oh, I can't do that or I can't get there. Um, so sometimes it's just like make a decision and get started and like it's okay if it changes. So like decide what you think you want now and then just be open like that might change in six months as I keep learning. You know, like I've wow. I've been doing a lot of, of digital the last few years. And now I'm like, ooh, I should try like industrial. I have no idea how to do that stuff, um, but I'm just gonna get yeah. started and see what it's like. Um, so yeah, I think I think just making the decision and then going for it is is really important. Yeah, and I I think it's really important what you you mentioned. Like getting started is definitely there's always multiple parts of the equation that we have to look at before we are able to make like a sound decision. Like for example, it's just like, all right, I wanna do this thing that I've seen. Now I just need to, it, there's a lot of things that I need to learn in order to do what I think is blank. But I, I was, um, you know, Chris Doe mentioned something in, um, in one of his LinkedIn posts, I think last week, where he was talking about how he would how his friends would tell him to and try to push him to be like an artist when he was in, I think, high school or when he was younger. I don't I don't want to put words in his mouth that he didn't say, but when he was younger and he would like scoff at them and be like, oh, I don't want to be a starving artist. That's what he, you know, that's what he mentioned right. in his post. But then it was not until he got, I think, I believe an internship or he found someone, I forget the person's name, but someone he was exposed to, and I think exposure is the, the perfect word, someone he was exposed to that was doing specifically what he wanted to do in his future so that he could try to reverse engineer what that individual was doing. It's very hard to not have a point in space and try to work yeah. up to it because you you don't even have the capacity to build your own scaffolding to that point. Yeah. Um, but being exposed to what could be allows you to kind of creatively and constructively think about how to actually get there or at least give you hey i like that and what we were talking about earlier being driven by your taste i like this thing how can i work up to either doing that thing or being that thing which i think totally i actually took a workshop with chris doe which was really fun um Ooh, and something he tell. asked yeah it was called it was the workshop was called business of design um and I took it with Patricia, actually. She's still on here. She might not be because it's Germany time. So she's probably going to bed soon. Um, oh, but the thing they asked, he asked in the beginning was like, what is your big audacious goal? Like, what are you, what do you want to achieve in three years? Um, basically, because like he, his rationale was three years gives you enough time to make a lot of progress on something um, and allows you to set what that big goal is. Because obviously just a year is not that much time when you think about it. Um, but three years, a lot happens in those three years. So that's something yeah. that is, is I found really valuable. It's like, what is my three-year plan instead of my five-year plan? It's like way more tangible, but still allows that flexibility to dream big in a way. Yeah. What is your, what is your three-year goal, Brandon? <laughs> three-year goal. I got goals for tomorrow. I can't think. <laughs> um, Honestly, with when you start, for me personally, when you start looking at, because the further you go out into the future, mm -hmm. the less accurate you're going to be. And you, what a lot of yeah. people do is also, I think Chris touches on this. We, um, we don't know how long time, how how much we. I actually think it's Elon Musk that talks about this. Um, we kind of don't realize how much can be done in a year right? and i don't even think like this is even to uh elon musk's point i think a lot of people just touch on this i think the last one that just comes to mind is elon uh, but it's the understanding of how we can actually use um time and so like for me i think it's nice when i start looking at five goal uh five year goals to be honest mm -hmm it's like very uh, vague and airy fluffy things, just like markers. Hey, I want to achieve this, th like buckets, basically. We want to have totally. this done, this done, this done, but then we have to, um, you know, honestly, I only really try to do that year wise. Like five years is a little long. I want to do things in years and be like, okay, well, how are we going to get these things at the end of the year? Um, what are we going to do for each, each month, for 12 months? What are we going to do yeah. for, 
um like i have to break it down like that because when you start doing like two years like i would hope that i'm probably doing so <laughs> i would be having to do some voodoo magic in this office to be like and i don't know what the, let me let me be quiet but i don't know what ritual i would need to do to figure out what i'm going to do in um two years i try to be really practical i'm like all right these are the resources that i have at my disposal um this is what we want to aim for in a year um and then let's scaffold for um, let's scaffold for the year. What is each month gonna look like? What is each week gonna look like? What is each day gonna look like in order for us to achieve that in in a year? It's like a math equation. I feel like the more you go out, the more uh, speculative you're going to be. So I wasn't totally. good at math. I got <laughs> a lot of a lot of D's until I fi I finally met um, a good math teacher, but. Uh, all right, let's look at the chat really quick because I, I I've seen some. I think we've we passed pie and burritos. And I think there's some some good <laughs> questions. <laughs> some good questions in the chat. Hold on. All right. Uh, let's scrounge. All right. Laura in the chat is saying, how we want to enter the field is such an interesting question. I have no design background and have been trying to break into UX, UI. However, it seems that I may need to join a firm as a project manager. How with that, I guess that's more of a statement than a question, but with that being said as a statement, what comes to mind when you hear that, Julie? Um, like, I is there any suggestions you would like to offer up to that or? Yeah, it depends. I mean, a lot of people say like get your foot in the door and then work your way into the position that you want to be in. But mm -hmm. if you're not going to enjoy that role, then I don't think it's worth doing, you know, like if you have the option, of course. Um, but I think a lot of times now within UX, especially like a lot of folks are self-taught. Everyone started somewhere. Right. Um, right. So you have to just stay confident throughout, you know, job rejections and things like that. Like things will happen if you keep working towards them. Um, it just might take a little time. So I found it really important to like attend networking events and like meet people and hear their story and hear how they got started. Like you said before, you know, like think of who maybe Christo had mentioned this too. Like think of who like inspires you and like who would be your dream mentor um, how did they right. get there? And then work backwards, reverse engineer it. Um, but yeah, it is it is hard to get that first job. It's like, you know, if you want to work at a coffee shop, even it's like, well, you need to have experience working at a coffee shop. And you're like, how do I get experience working at a coffee shop if I haven't worked at a coffee shop? You know, <laughs> set up your kitchen, <laughs> have your mom yeah. and dad as your or your whoever's in the yeah. house with you. They're your customers. You make coffee every morning. I have plenty of experience. I have, I make my, <laughs> I make hot coffee every day for me and my partner when we wake up. I got these. There you go. There you I go. I know how to chop up bean. I, I, I think that's also perspective. Yeah. Uh, too, yeah. where it's like, and this goes back to what you were saying earlier about skills. Do you have the potential and the capabilities to do what the job is asking? At your hackathon or your, at your hackathon, it was obvious that you did. You put in the work that showcased that you had those things, but you also had to know to tell somebody that these were the skills that you had. You needed to know how to flaunt it as not just doing it. So yeah. if you know, you know how to make beans or not make beans, I have no idea how to make that, but if you know how to make coffee really, really well, and yeah. uh, you're trying to go to a coffee shop, you just need to present yourself as knowing how to do exactly what they want you to do. Yeah. That doesn't have to look like also and have had 12 years of being a barista. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, I, it's yeah, I think it's it's important also to be upfront and like self-aware of what skills you need to work on too. Um, yes. That's something I think a lot of employers and people who are looking to hire folks like look for. It's like, are you self-aware of the skills you have as well as the skills that mm -hmm. you want to learn? Um, yep. That's a really valuable characteristic to to think on too. So yes. yeah, if you're just getting started and trying to get that first job, um, work on building that portfolio, work on building your skill set, and then being able to showcase that. Um, yes. But also write out like what skills you think you need to work on further. 
um, that'll help you like keep that self-awareness in play. But I couldn't have said it any better. And um, I hope, Laura, I hope that is like, cause I see your next thing was I don't have a portfolio because my current job has nothing to do with UX. Take the time. If you want it, you'll find the time or make, not just find the time, you'll make the time. Yeah, and um, work with like conceptual pro- projects or like find a local business that maybe like you could volunteer doing work for. Um, you don't need to have the job to make a portfolio piece. It could be something that you thought of on your own, something like we're doing today, you know, or it could be like you work with a nonprofit or a local business and then design something for them. Um, that's a way that you can get a portfolio piece started. That's how I got started was like making my own concepts and projects and putting them on gotcha. a website and calling it a portfolio, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And she, uh, she mentions even something even better. First off, Hey, what's going on, Tom? And, uh, glad to see you, Julie. He says hello too. Well, everybody's Hi. saying hello in the chat. <laughs> but, um, hello. Laura, the, hello. The, she, she says the problem is that I have decades of experience already. I would not be coming in as a junior person in regard to anything but design skills. What do you have to say to that? I know my my state statement slash question answer, but I'll let you tackle that. Yeah, so like you're farther along in your career and you don't wanna enter as like a junior designer, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Is the question. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. Cause I, you know, I, I still am early in career, I would consider. So I feel like it's, it's it's about being transparent about what you're looking for um, with that employer and being upfront with those skills. But, you know, if you work hard at it, like you'll you'll progress quickly, hopefully. But, yeah, I feel like I don't have a good answer for that one. Brandon, what is what is your burning answer? I, I have a I have a pretty good one because I get this all the time from I have a lot of students who are switchers they're coming from the fashion industry they're coming from the dental industry uh they're coming from like they're a mechanic and from everything and they're and they've already been in the industry for like 10 15 years and they've have these nice salaries but you know their industry has gotten slapped or something has happened and now they're looking for um something that is going to i don't want to use the word stable because nothing's really stable um yeah another opportunity that is more lucrative there we go. And so their biggest concern is, well, I have all this work experience, but now it's dead. That's not exactly Got true. It. If you're a dentist, you have 15 years of experience over a designer who has 15 years of experience because you understand the operations that and the challenges that a dentist would have. You understand the pain that you were saying as a as a host, you were like, what are we even using? for our management system. This is atrocious. Yeah, at 15. <laughs> right. And so when you see, pro- everybody can see a problem, but now you're going from 15 years of experience in a field, and now you're trying to cross into basically just another skill set. You can stay in the same industry. I'm using the example of dentist, dentistry right now, or uh, healthcare for that matter. Um, you can stay in the same field with your 15 years of experience and learn UI UX and go back in. So when you talk to potential employers, you say, Hey, uh, you have to, and this also goes into, it's not just skill set. This goes into understanding how to present your skill set. You have to position yourself as somebody who understands the pain points in the business of healthcare, whatever industry you go inside healthcare, but you also now have the experience as a UI UX designer to solve the problems that you've had in the industry for 15 years. Because totally. the, the thing is, is that when you're a UI UX designer and you're going into an industry, what you're lacking is business sense. When you have design skills, you're going into an industry to learn the business that you are designing for. You just have the research skills and the Uh, design shops to create something for business. However, on the other side, somebody who doesn't have design skills, who has been in the industry for 15 years, understands the business of that industry better than um, a designer. So you have to lean heavy on, hey, I've understand, or I've been in this business for 15 years. I've now just learned UI UX. Uh, I now have this new skill set to help 
the technological side of the business that I've been in. So this works if you're a mechanic, if you're a, um, even if you've been in the restaurant industry um, as a as a as a manager, you've been in there for a long time. Um, You'll truly know you who you're designing for best. Ex you know? Exactly. And most people think that when they switch skill sets or careers that they have to just null and void the, the industry experience that they've had. And, and I've had this, uh, students both in the dentistry field and in the fashion industry who have been in there for 10, 15 years. And, like, and they, their first thing is like, I'm sad that I have to start over. I'm like, who told you that? And they're like, I yeah. don't know. I'm just, I'm switching skill sets. Isn't that what's supposed to happen? I'm like, no. Why would you do that to yourself? You have 15 years of experience. What we need to do <laughs> is we need to find uh, companies. If you're from the dentist industry, healthcare, we need to find companies who are hiring for designers. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> um, because you're, if you start looking at the thing where you have to start over is only applicable if you have no other of value skill sets but UI, UX design going to another industry. Um, and I'm like, why would, you know, if you if you have the knowledge in dentistry or the healthcare industry and you're adding a skill set, just go back to healthcare and work for one of the companies at, you know, at a higher level um, with those skills. Obviously you're not gonna be, um, you, you know, there's, I, I can't say obviously, I, I don't know the, the context, we're talking hypotheticals, but, um, that's the scenario. And I, I hope Laura, um, that answers, she says, Brandon, that makes a great point, but I think you are unique in your thoughts about the past experience being valuable to apply to a UX job. I don't think so. I don't think it's unique. Um, because I the think, thing is when people go yeah, ahead. Some, yeah. Something I've, I've, I've talked about a lot in the past is like your career narrative. Um, yes. which I don't know if that's a that's common important. term, but that's something I use, um, yeah. especially in UX design in a lot of design fields, like storytelling is a huge aspect. And that's something I feel like I leverage a lot when I'm looking for work, um, yeah. is like my story where I started, where I've been, obviously I am still early in my career. Um, but like this journey into design has been, it's been eight to 10 years already. Right. So, yeah. um, like I, I leverage that story. So I actually was a PM at Microsoft. I wasn't a designer. Um, so I was a product manager there. So more on the engineering yeah. side of things. And I pivoted back into design. Um, granted, it was like a smaller pivot because I had experience before. Um, mm -hmm. But I used that opportunity to move back into full UX design and like fully flex that muscle. So yeah. my story there was like, hey, I was like, learning design on my own in college. And I wanted to try working at a big company like Microsoft and understand like more of the engineering side of things. Um, I also was like a more design focused PM, which was great. But um, after that, I was like, okay, now I wanna get back into design. I've learned how to manage a product, work with developers and so on. Now I wanna get back and like actually flex more of my design muscle. And so I switched back in. So yeah. being able to like, figure out that story, I think is really important. Yeah, I, I think it's not just important, it's 100% necessary. And yeah. this is the conversation I kind of have with not only my students, but just people I, who have this similar challenge of either on a, I either want to switch or um, something related to that, that challenge. And it's really not the lack of skills anyone can learn anything we're in the information age where you can pick up anything and learn it awesome but when does what you know become a value and allow you to make an income when you're able to communicate to somebody what you know is of value to them that's only that's the only way um you're going to be able to use what you know to be a value or make an income um <laughs> I, right you have to you have to be able to do sales basically what that is is hey um i am capable of this it seems as if you would be you're in the need of something like this because we've talked about it um how about we do this and yeah. if you're not able to have that conversation or even know how to 
convey your value to somebody, how do they know your use to them? Um, this is, and that's why, you know, going back to my phrase where it was like, people need to know that you care before they care. If you can't explain to someone your value um, and what that takes is for you to understand someone's unique situation um, yeah. and tailor your, what are we calling it? Career narrative? Your Yeah, that's what I say. Career narrative. Yeah, I th that, that's a perfect name to it. Before I was just like, <laughs> I would use my long sentence that I'm doing now to explain this, but your career narrative <laughs> to explain, hey, I understand that you're in this situation, which is that should be apparent from the job posting. It seems that you're in need of somebody like this. Let me explain to you with my career background and what I've done in 15 whatever years, uh, plus my UI UX skill set, how I can be of use in um, your company or in, in doing work with you. Yeah, I like what you said. I think we're still on Laura, right? This is Laura's yeah. question. Yeah, like if you are a dentist, let's say, right? There's a lot of companies out there that need UX work in the dentist industry, and so like finding those companies are maybe even like looking into doing design work at your current company um connecting with designers there i think is is really important as well i hope that helped <laughs> i hope it does too uh yeah. we have we have reverb mike in the chat saying you can learn brain surgery on youtube i mean like, i wild. mean that is that's it's weird but if we, if we take uh, i'm not even sure if i want to entertain it but let's change it to a different um subject julie we have about let's see I think honestly we have about like four we're, we're close to wrapping up so let's dig back into the design really quick let's check in yeah i've done a lot since we last checked in so i'm <laughs> i've been working on this calendar piece um right now it's just black and white i might add some color i kind of like having color in there so i might do that a little bit later um but right now the way i want to have it is so that when you click on a certain date um, you'll see info about the orders for that day. So mm. for today, for example, um, something that is really important with pop-ups is like, you're not going to just make food for one person. So there is an order minimum aspect to it. So there's a little yeah. um, notification that you've reached your order minimum. You have however many orders it is. And then this gives you insight into how many meals were ordered um, with a little progress bar as well. Then I wanted to include like, what are my net earnings for today? How many new customers do I have? And how many returning customers do I have? Do I have? So this is like the core of that first, like it's kind of the home experience in a way. And then there will be two call to actions here. So either active orders, um, which will bring you to this page, which we'll probably have time to go into tomorrow. And then also managing your menu. So this is where we are at currently. Um, and then we obviously have the navigation bar as well. Got it. Now, let me ask this, because it seems like we're in the wireframe-esque mode. Are we yeah. doing anything, because we're at the tail end here, I kind of want to give people like little secrets or tidbits about what we're going to hop in tomorrow. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what we might be doing tomorrow while we yeah. continue this project? Yeah, so tomorrow, so we're going to finish up um, maybe probably two more of the kind of navigation pages that, so to speak. So we worked on our calendar. We worked on, we're going to work on active orders, maybe earnings or profile, one or two. And then we're going to prototype the whole thing and bring it to like that full fidelity place so adding <laughs> um different visual treatments to it so adding some color messing around with the way it looks um that's mainly where we're gonna get to tomorrow so we'll hopefully have a fully prototyped you know minimal experience of this app working tomorrow end of day so be there to see it <laughs> be there or be square whichever <laughs> Maybe you want to be square. Choose choose a, squares choose are a cool shape too. that you... Yeah, squares are cool too. <laughs> um, they have corners. All right. Okay. So in our last five minutes, <sighs> I'm trying to think. Let me, let's look for last fleeting questions. And then if anything, we will wrap up of... And we kind of did a wrap up of what we're going to be getting into tomorrow. Laura, totally. just so that in the time that these 
or really everybody in the audience doesn't get to spend with us. You guys have to wait till tomorrow. It's so sad to see our beautiful faces. Um, we're going to go ahead and showcase where we might be able to find Julie until tomorrow. Yeah. So, all right, let me see. Let's scavenge the, the chat really quick. <laughs> Reverb Mike is like spoilers. We need to have spoilers so you guys come back tomorrow, same time, and watch as Julie completes this amazing prototype. All right. Um, let's see. We're talking about a lot about confidence. There's still, I kind of want to have Julie touch on this before, or at least see what her answer is to this. So this yeah. is Laura again, um, talking about how she, let me find the exact thing. I have applied to numerous jobs. They are looking for previous UX experience. No one has thought that my previous experience is of interest or translatable, leverageable to the job. Thoughts and or statements to that statement. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's like you, you got to keep going. And I know that's hard to hear um, because if, it, if you've been turned down a lot, um, but maybe, I don't know, you've probably done this, but reaching out rather than just applying to a job, I think it's really important to try to build a connection first. So reaching out to and, and come from a place of learning. So like, what are the expectations of this role? Um, trying to find like a designer who works there already. Um, yes like empathy is a huge thing. So connecting with someone, everyone's been in your place before, either they've pivoted themselves or they came from a self-taught background or, um, you know, they started their first job years ago. Um, people are typically like very receptive to learning more about that and connecting with you on that level. So that could be a good place to start with future employers is like before just applying, reach out and get yep. to know them. Um, that's probably what I would give advice to do. I, I'm very much in agreement on that. I, I talk to people who are in the same situation and I hear that and I immediately, I assume it might not be the best, but I assume that they are slinging, I call it slinging resumes. Mm -hmm. And that is the quickest way, especially if you're in this position, that is the best way to get shut down because the people on the other side, usually dealing with recruiters, whose job is really just to look at resumes and their on paper capability and sling those over to um, the product team or whoever's team you're applying to. There's a middleman. And so you're not, it's very, it's very challenging to explain to anybody if you're in this situation, um, what your value is in your particular scenario. Whereas if you, like Julie said, if you build that relationship and you are, you've set up a call or even, not even before that, but you've somehow, like I said earlier, showcase your value to these people where I've, like I said, I've done a whole bunch of free work by um, looking at companies I'd like to work with. What are the opportunities I could potentially work with them at? Ask if they are in need of the thing that I've uh, analyzed that they're trying to accomplish and really not doing what they, uh, the top notch that they would like to be doing, offer the thing that they would help them get to that next level for free. And they're like, uh, we want more of that because we couldn't do that internally. How about we do more of this? So it's opportunities like that. Um, so Laura, keep going. And uh, I believe in you. Matt, <laughs> we believe we in the Adobe chats in line <laughs> believe in you. Um, we hope to hear back and see it. Uh, amazing success and also as in in slight closing we got about two two and a half two two minutes here one and a half minutes um i want to thank you guys each and every one of you guys for coming out uh, julie's been doing some work on these active orders if you guys want more laughs talks about pie burrito but more importantly the amazing design and stuff about adobe xd i think we should do a little bit more of that tomorrow we've been doing a lot of wireframing today talking about uh, icons for design, cool stuff related to how Julie grabs assets. Um, it's really awesome. So yeah. we have one minute. Uh, Julie, is there anything you would like to close with? Yeah, well, tomorrow we're going to get into a lot more fun stuff like animation. So with prototyping, um, so stick around for that. And yeah, we'll finish up like one flow of this experience and then have a fully fun, responsive 
experience by tomorrow end of day <laughs> which is exciting In, indeed all right guys so before we leave if you have had even the slightest smile laugh or really just excited about what we've done here and even tomorrow don't forget to hit that like button on whichever platform you're on or if you're even doubly excited hit that like button here on behance for us and also on youtube do do a double tap as i like to double say. tap <laughs> double tap all right ladies and gentlemen your boy brandon gross and julie sandusky <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow same time so we'll see you then thank you so much for coming Bye, everyone.